Now, what I've got to do to put Peterloo into context, I've got to explain who was really in control of England in the 150 years or so between the civil wars of the 17th century and Peterloo in the early 19th century. And to find out who really had the power back then, I'm driving through the exquisite countryside of Derbyshire, and I'm heading for a stately pile that's without doubt one of the great treasures of England. It's still in private hands. It's the family home of the Dukes of Devonshire. And I've come here to Chatsworth to tell the story of a distant ancestor of the present Duke, a man called William Cavendish. And his story, I think, is very revealing. The story begins in 1660, when, after years of civil war, Charles II was restored to the English throne. And William Cavendish was one of the young noblemen who carried the train at his coronation. Now, these were glorious years in English history. Charles, of course, was the Merry Monarch, and Cavendish, too, had a reputation as a gambler and a womanizer. And yet, beneath all this frivolity, a serious question bubbled. Who now really held the power in the land? The king, the parliament, the people? The death of Charles' father, Charles I, hung as an ominous reminder now of the limits on the power of kings. Well, this question of who really controlled England came to a head in 1685 with the death of Charles II, because the man who inherited the throne was his brother James, and no merry monarch he. James saw himself as an absolute ruler. He seemed to ignore the lessons of the Civil War. He wanted the army back under his direct control. He ruled without Parliament. And what was worse in the eyes of Protestant England, he was a Catholic, and he dreamt of reimposing Catholicism on his kingdom. Now, you look at the situation from the point of view of a man like William Cavendish. By this point in the story, 1685, he'd inherited from his father. He was master of Chatsworth. He was the fourth Earl of Devonshire. He had a seat now, not in the Commons, but in the House of Lords. And he believed, as a member of the landed aristocracy, he had a natural part to play in the running of the kingdom. But this new king was cutting the aristocracy out of the loop. It was clear something had to be done. And it's what happened next that reveals who really held the strings in early modern England. The scene now shifts to London, where Cavendish met in secret with six friends, all of them, like him, members of England's landed elite. And between them, they plotted the overthrow of King James II. They wrote in code a letter, which they smuggled abroad to a Protestant prince, William of Orange. The letter said, come to England, overthrow James, take the crown, rule in his place, we'll back you. William of Orange did as the letter suggested. He sailed to England with an army. Meanwhile, Cavendish rode to Derby with a small retinue to hold the north until the transfer of power was secure. James II fled to the continent, and the glorious revolution of 1688 was complete. Now, I want to ask just one question about these events. I want to ask, what part did the people play in this so-called revolution? Usually, in a revolution, the people rise up and overthrow the established order. This wasn't a revolution. At best, this was a kind of palace coup. One king moved aside, another brought into play. And who's controlling the action? A small circle of wealthy landowners. We call it the Glorious Revolution. But all it did was to transfer power out of the hands of kings into the hands of the rich. Kings now ruled under the thumb of Parliament, a debating chamber of lords and gentlemen from which ordinary people were excluded. And true democracy remained as distant a dream as ever. For his part in the Glorious Revolution, William Cavendish was made a Duke, the first Duke of Devonshire, and his power and his influence grew. 
In this part of England, young gentlemen seeking to advance their careers would come here to Chatsworth. They'd curry favour with the Duke. In elections, only those with property could vote, and the Duke's candidates stood unopposed. He had five seats in the House of Commons he could just hand out as gifts. His heirs rose to high office. They became ministers, even prime ministers. And for 150 years, the power of property, the power of the land, continued unquestioned. 